Hello, welcome to Spotlight, a yellow globe of artistic intensity. Spotlight, brought to you by the Isle of Man Arts Council. This evening, could you be the next Manx Bard? The search is on. Speaking of searches, the Manx Wildlife Trust are also looking for the next Biosphere Artist in Residence. And we chat with local author Joanne Clegg, ahead of the release of her fourth novel. Remember, do get in touch with any creative artistic endeavours you might be involved in, planning, hoping to create or would really like to. That's right, put in the spotlight. Musical, literary, poems, ceramic, sculpture, drag, film, mime, social media. Why not? Punk, whatever. If you've got something, something I've forgotten, get in contact. Howard Kane at manxradio.com, spotlight at manxradio.com. Put a knee on the cane, they'll all get there. I'd love to hear from you. So, could you be a poet and perhaps just don't know it? Could you find the time to make up a rhyme, spraying words out like Banksy about all things quite Manxy? If this sounds like you, stay tuned. The search is on for the next Manx bard to take over from the wonderful Boxy, who comes to the end of her tenure in just a few weeks' time, unbelievably. But she remains a bard for life, of course. Once a bard, always a bard. To find out more about what's involved and how you could get involved, I had a chat with another bard, on the Bardic Committee, Annie Kizik, and began by checking with her that I was correct in thinking we're already up to Bard number 10. It is. It it seems to have gone very quickly from my time as Bard number 5. And certainly going back to um, our first living Manx Bard, who is actually um, down as the second Manx Bard, Stacey Astle. It was nine nine years ago now. So, uh, yeah, the, the Manx Bard competition goes from strength to strength. So when we're looking for a new bard then, we'll just go into the process in a minute, but what what are we sort of looking for, do you think, when we're thinking about the next bard? What, what makes, if it's not too vague a question, a good bard? There would be many answers to that, but from my point of view, um, first of all, they really need to be able to write. <laughs> write something worth reading, I think. Um, being able to perform what you do, I think that is certainly helpful, but it is not an absolute uh, necessity. Some people are better page writers, if you like, um, that would read uh, any work they do. If you read it, you get more from it. Others um, are very much on the entertaining style of things, um, would be happy on the stage. Um, so some people might think that's what you need from a bard. Mm. Um, so well, we I was don't, thinking that. Yeah. I'm, I'm assuming that there's an element whoever t- gets the bard, they would be expected to be able to perform their work in front of people, would they? It would be, it would be, um, it would be desirable, mm. certainly. Um, how much you do of spoken performance, uh, how much commitment there is to that, would really be down to the individual who's successful, um, because all of us have different you know, we're working in different ways. We have different uh, people we socialise with, different uh, circles we're involved in. Uh, so it would be very, it's not prescriptive that you have to do, you know, X number of performances or X number of poems. You are expected to write some things, obviously, during your year, even if you've got a, a huge back catalogue of poetry. Um, and indeed, that's one of the very enjoyable parts of it, I think, from my point of view, um, having that knowledge that producing a poem, say, monthly for the paper or, or wherever, um, keeps you on board, reminds you what you know why you're there and what you're doing. Um, but also at the end of the year, then you've got you know you've got something to show for your your year there, certainly. And certainly, I was speaking to previous bards, as we've chatted to most of them over the last few years here on Spotlight, and I think they've all sort of said to a man and a woman that, yes, it's it's sort of inspired them because they've had sort of commitments to a degree. I think they felt they've all written more during their bardic year for the reasons you've just outlined there. And then sometimes also perhaps written about because they might have been commissioned to write a piece for a certain event or a certain time of year, a certain person, a certain memorial, whatever the case may be, writing about something they might not have otherwise been inspired to write about. Absolutely. And, you know, this can continue, of course. So 
a number of the bards, I think most of us, um, have continued writing and being asked to write and perform in uh, varied setups over the years, uh, perhaps not as as frequently, as intensely as you do for your own um, year as the Manx Bard, but you still carry on in that sort of role, certainly. So, yeah, there's lots of opportunities there to, to, to do things and perhaps the things that you wouldn't necessarily have thought about doing. And everybody seems to manage to get a, a rabbit out of the hat at the end of the day, you know, working under pressure, slight pressure sometimes just helps to make sure it gets done as i'm sure you know <laughs> oh it's always the way it's always the way. So, so would you would you say there is a specific style of writing or something leaving aside obviously you know the commitments or what, what people are expected to do during the bardic year or asked to do their own style of writing is it something that does it have to be specifically manx centric or someone who's inspired by something from the isle of man can it be more general than that is there, is there a specific area looking at when it comes to style of writing uh, in poetry? Well, what we ask for from the poets who would like to become the bard is to submit three poems. Um, and how and what the content is, is up to them. But the remit is you are there as the Manx bard. So it's expected that there will be some Manx content in some way, not necessarily through everything you write and do because you know you're in the Isle of Man it's going to happen anyway to an extent um but yes yeah, so certainly you, you are representing the island but that doesn't mean you've got to keep writing 100 odes to Manx cats and Luxy wheels and things I mean that would get very boring wouldn't it Indeed. Uh, yes so yeah um you might be somebody who likes to write in a formal structure um uh, sort of rhythmically with with rhyme and that might be your particular skill and that's fine um equally you might be more comfortable feel more fluent um in free verse so you wouldn't necessarily have um an obvious rhyme at the end of a line but you might be hiding a few rhymes in here and there and there should be whatever style you write in um you need to do it as well as you can i think uh, it, I think it's actually quite hard to get really good rhyming poetry um, that's sort of not just on a, not just superficial. I mean, speaking for myself, I like to see writing that might move me. Um, delighted if something sends me into tears. Um, others might not. They might prefer to laugh, but, you know, an emotional content. Um, I like to see myself. There's a deeper meanings perhaps hinted at in the poem i don't know i think those are parts of good writing but that's me and i'm not the only i'm not the only person who be um making a decision on this there'll be a, a panel um of people from very different backgrounds but with some experience in the world of writing poetry so let's talk a little bit about the process and you you said there's a panel there so anyone listening to this and thinking well you know you know what i wouldn't mind having a go, putting my neck on the block, as it were, or at least sticking my head above the parapet and sending some of my work in. How does the process work? OK, well, you've got quite a bit of time um, up to when the entries have to be in, which are bef uh, on or before Friday the 16th of August. Um, the actual competition um which or come audition or whatever you call hmm. it which sounds scary but actually i'm sure it is a little bit scary of course if you're on the other side from people and you don't know what to expect but we're we're all friendly and we've all been through it ourselves um that's on the the following week on saturday the 24th that'll be in the afternoon and then um nobody knows if they've been picked or not uh, to be the bard till um and the inauguration, which is the following day on Sunday, the 25th of August. So if you were interested in submitting things again, Friday, the 16th of August is, is your date. And you can find how to enter. And it's quite straightforward by going to the Manx Bard Facebook site. Or you can email manxbard at gmail.com. Manxbard at gmail.com. And that's all small case and you can be um, have the information there. So that's fairly straightforward. Just 
But finally, what sort of level of commitment are we talking about? Because again, you sort of we've hinted at sort of some, some expectations there, but people might thinking maybe if they're still working or have other commitments, is it the sort of thing that you can sort of fit into your life or is it something you need to, to sort of dedicate yourself more to? I would say past experiences, uh, most people who are doing this also have a job. I did at the time. <laughs> now in the luxury of being retired, but you know, when I was, well, yes, I work full time. Uh, and, and the other bards are in that position too. You don't have to be, you can be retired, of course. Um, and it's up to you what you can give into it. I mean, it, in the end of the day, it, it's quality not quantity that counts, I think, but well, quantity is nice sometimes, but you do what you can do. Nothing is expected of you. You might have some ideas of your own for developing poetry and many of the past bards have, 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 have done so, come up with initiatives, work with different groups, but only what you can do comfortably within your own life. Okay, and and just finally, is there? I, I can't remember now, but is there a modest stipend attached to the position or not? There is, yes, and of course you do get the the chance to wear on the inauguration day the the rather um, rather exciting. Uh, outfit and carry the, the staff and sit in the bardic chair the and bardic actually chair, it's rather you? it's rather a nice ceremony um for all yes it uh, reminds me vaguely of being at the national estate for the new wales for <laughs> <laughs> lots of rogue is, druids is, is this taking place in the barn again the yes, uh, wonderful yes. barn down yeah. by uh, Paul. Yeah. That's lovely a great place to do it so there we go um if you feel inspired, go to the Facebook page, get all the details there now. You have time to put pen or pencil to paper if you haven't done so already, but you've been thinking about it. And it just gives the final date again, the actual competition and the uh, next bard will be announced when? Yes, uh, the entries need to be in by Friday the 16th of August and the actual competition, um, if you're called to that, uh, Saturday the 24th of August and the inauguration the next day. You have a couple of weeks to get pen to paper, or more likely finger to keyboard, so don't delay. It will only get harder, rhyming Douglas with, um, barder. Spotlight, brought to you by the Isle of Man Arts Council. There's another artistic search afoot in a moment, but before that, let's hear the first part of a chat I had with local author Joanne Clegg. Well known for her journalism work in print, radio and television over the years, Jo's now been a full-time author for some time and is just about to publish her latest novel, The House of Hope, her fourth book for publishers Canelo, the first in a new saga. I began by asking her if she started out in her writing career, thinking that perpetual question for so many budding writers... I wonder if I've got a novel in me. I think it was actually that. I think I thought to myself, um, I want to write a novel. And I didn't really think much beyond that. So, uh, yes, yeah, so it was a really nice surprise when my agent said, how about a series? I was like, oh, great. OK. So, And, uh, yeah, we were saying earlier, weren't we? I think it's two years on now. I'm on to book yeah, four. Yeah, must be round about there, yeah, I think. Yeah. Round about that. And it is yeah. book four. Now, it's, it's the first one, though, in a new saga. It, yeah, it's confusing. So it's book it's book one of a new series, and the series is called The House of Help for Friendless Girls, and the title of book one is The House of Hope. Um, and even I get confused. You know, I say it's The House of Help or The House of Hope for Friendless Girls, so... But yeah, it's House of Hope. <laughs> now, for those who perhaps haven't read any of your work, and there can't be that many after uh, book one, two and three, and I know a lot of people, <laughs> you have fans around the world and certainly on the Isle of Man now, but it, so this is historical fiction based in your hometown of Sheffield. Yes. And so do you, is this something, again, I know it's, we've spoken about this before, it's sort of you, you feel like you like writing about what you know about and you're passionate about but is it something then are you inspired by the city itself are you inspired by the people of the city or is it sort of certain events which you've seen in history what is it which sort of inspires each new story i think um i think partly um i i know i've got the voice right i know you know i can speak sheffield if you like <laughs> so that's a, a, it's quite comforting actually to to know that i've got that voice and i can write that voice um and then what I've done, really, it's uh, everything that's inspired me has been because of research. So book one, um, which was The Great Flood of Sheffield, the research I did for that led to book two, which led to book three. And then while I was writing book three, um, I came across the title of a of a of this house of help for friendless girls in Paradise Square in Sheffield. 
and it was so the name was so Dickensian and it just really captured my imagination so um, I suppose I'm, I'm a bit like a magpie I suppose you know I, I'll write the books and while I'm doing the research something will catch my eye and I'll go right okay I think I could actually build a story around this um, find some characters to populate the scene um, and just take it from there. So are the characters are they all fictional or any of the characters based on real people? The characters in the new book are all fictional, um, which they had to be really because because it was a real house of help, a real a real place uh, created by uh, philanthropists and forward thinking women. Um, I knew the warden or the matron. Um, the the title was was occasionally sort of interchangeable. I knew that she would be a pivotal figure in the novels. Um, so she had to be fictional um, and then every girl or woman who comes to the house is a fictional character because that meant I had more freedom with plots if, if they were purely fictional characters. But the place was real and was open for over 100 years, actually, just taking in girls as young as 11, um, women in their 20s and 30s. So, yeah, did an amazing job. And then within the narrative, are, are there any sort of real historical happenings? Or again, do you take that? Is it placed with real buildings, uh, but the events and the characters are all fictional? Yeah, occasionally, you know, I'll, I'll hang um, a, a, a plot or, or, or a characterization off a, a, a real event. And I like to do that. I, I, I've always have done that. And it, I find it grounds me, actually. Um, so in the House of of hope for example um, I talk about the smallpox epidemic at the time and that led me down a rabbit hole of um, <laughs> um, vaccination actually which you know had so many parallels with what's been happening in recent years with Covid you know the, the, the there was back then a faction who didn't agree with vaccination there were debates in government about whether it should be compulsory or not um, so that's I, I love finding those parallels. And do you, when it comes to the actual storylines themselves, what inspires you there? Is this something, you know, do you just have an idea in your head which will just sort of crop up in the middle of the night and you jot it down <laughs> on your pad by the bedside? Or is it something, do you do research? Do you look at some, you know, read old newspapers, delve back into history and get inspired by certain events and then fictionalise those? Yeah, um, it usually happens in the shower, actually, and I have to get <laughs> out. Um, so this this book was, um, I, I thought, you know, I've got I've got this warden, she's writing in her in her ledger she's she's writing up the 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 recent cases that have arrived in the house and and it, it's all it's all a what if isn't it so i thought to myself well what if there's a knock on the door and it's three o'clock in the morning and what if there's a girl on the doorstep and who is she and why why is she there and that's kind of the jumping off point the narrative itself, like I said, we're on to this sort of second or the first book in the new saga, as it were, book four for you in, as mm. we count upwards. <laughs> but it is the actual narrative linear. So does it, uh, is there any continuance of any of the characters from the previous ones, whether the descendants or otherwise, we're in a different era, era. But is that sort of, is there a linear progression that way or is it totally new? There is a linear progression. Um, in this series, the, the warden will feature in, in every book, um, she is quite a pivotal character um and um yeah so so it's linear and, and the first series is linear as well I, I move forward in time i never go backwards i'm always moving forward but and then characters will crop up again um and in fact the novel that i'm working on now um there are some characters who are right back in in book one in the ragged valley who are going to make a guest appearance and i like doing things like that for for readers you know for people who've read all the series and then because i enjoy that if i'm reading a series and a character crops up from an earlier novel you know you feel like you feel connected don't you you feel like you know oh here's so and so and i know them and so i quite like i quite like doing that yeah and the storyline for for each book when you're getting around to it again presumably you have you know it's sketched out in your mind or you might have it more detailed than that but are do you write so that you stick very much to your storyline you've got or are you the sort of author that you get so far and then sometimes think oh gosh and perhaps veer off on a tangent i do i am guilty of that i, I do send um i mean my editor i'll send my poor editor a completed synopsis for example 
and it's, it's everything in there. And then I'll actually start writing the book. Um, and yes, characters do things that you're not expecting them to do, or, or some, some the, the plot will change. So when I when I uh, get around to handing the book over, I send the fresh synopsis and say, actually, this is now the story. Um, so I've got the gist of it. I, I always know how it how it's going to start. That's really important to me to get that to get that nailed. Kind of what's in the middle, and I always know how it's going to end. But within that, I sometimes veer off script. Yeah. <laughs> and then, when it comes to you, you've hinted at you know you do do research there, and uh, I was looking earlier on flipping through and at the acknowledgements you talk about tramping through you know cemeteries and mm. deciphering Victorian <laughs> sort of uh, scripts and such like. Do you do a lot of research? Is that important for you to really do a, a good grounding in research before you start writing each book? It is to me. It gives me a, a level of security, actually, and and comfort. And once I've started writing, there will be times where I do, I will have to research something, something small, a, a little nugget, and I'll have to stop and, and do that. But um, I don't like to interrupt the flow too much once I've got started. So, um, yeah, I, I do as much research as I can. Um, and obviously, I'm, you know, a lot of it is online, but nothing beats actually going to these places. Well, I was thinking, do you go back to Shape of the Moon, walk the streets a bit and sort of soak, soak it, let I, it soak in? You know what, more than I ever have done in my life, actually. Um, I lived there for 20-odd years before I moved here, and I know so much more about my home city now than I did when I left. Um, and, uh, yeah, I love visiting the cemeteries. Uh, I get a lot of names from there. Um, and, yeah, the places. And so on my last visit, we had a wander around... Paradise Square um, and yeah I dragged my sister to a cemetery and we tramped around in the mud for an afternoon so you get it, it's just for the feel really. More from Joanne next week when we hear about future plans another novel is already done and events planned for the launch of The House of Hope. The book is published by Canelo it's released on the 15th of August. Now, I mentioned another artistic search. This time, it's by the Manx Wildlife Trust and UNESCO Biosphere Isle of Man, who are looking for the third Biosphere Artist in Residence. Current Biosphere Artist in Residence, Ali Hodgson, and Head of Engagement at Manx Wildlife Trust, Graeme Makepeace Warren, dropped into the Spotlight studio to tell me more. And I asked Graeme if the initiative had proved successful for them. I think fantastically so. In terms of my job at Manx Wildlife Trust, this is genuinely one of the highlights. Um, you know, I, I am an art lover and my wall is steadily growing with artworks by artists in residence of Max Wildlife Trust and UNESCO Biosphere. Um, yeah, the, the Biosphere Artists in Residence started uh, a, a couple of years ago now. We're the only uh, uh, artist in residency on Ireland. Um, it's uh, fully funded by the Isle of Man Arts Council. And it's really an opportunity for us to host an up-and-coming artist uh, to uh, enable them to to work with art and nature as a subject matter. Um, and it helps us engage the public around nature and it helps develop the island's uh, artistic talents, which it, it, it's all positive. And was that the original aim, to sort of take a different angle in order to get people engaged with art and nature and the whole model of sustainability? Yeah, I think I have to give some credit to our CEO, Lee Morris. He worked with artists and residents previously in, in previous roles so he very much brought the idea to us um, and uh, it does just just make perfect sense art and nature sit so comfortably to, com comfortably together um, we had a, an exhibition recently in um, uh, Port Erin Art of Wild um, and it's just so easy to get artists to provide artworks that are uh, based in on or around wildlife and nature they the, the two subjects sit together so well uh, and I think if you look at a lot of artworks over the years, there will always be some kind of natural element to them. And obviously you, you deal with the public all the time within your role. Have you noticed a sort of change or people engaging with the artwork when you've been out and about at the various, you know, at the reserves? Because I know there, are, there have been things done at reserves, there have been done stuff down at, you know, Port Aaron at the various events. Have you noticed people engaging with the work? I think certainly in terms of our engagement work and our what we call interpretation, the way that people interpret our sites, you can definitely see the the influence of our, our artists and residents coming through. Um, our first artist, artist in residence, our inaugural artist in res residence, Claire Payne uh, was the 22-23 uh, artist in residence 
and she's got some fantastic works for example the mural at the end of the airs nature discovery center um and, and bits and pieces like that that you can see as you go around our sites i think it is just making things a little bit more interesting a little bit more lively a little bit more entertaining and i think that's a fantastic thing but uh, claire was a fantastic inaugural artist in residence uh, she still works with us she's a, a, a marine assistant um just one day a week but it's great to still have her around and still involved with engagement as well uh, and obviously now we have ali uh, who's i can't believe it but already coming up to the end of her tenure as artist in residence um and again ali is also our shop buyer um she's also our comms officer um and these all happen post you know becoming artist in residence of course but uh, just having those influences throughout the stuff that we stock in our shop uh, and the way that we uh, engage with the public is is really really powerful and i just love to see it and ali how and i guess from what graham was saying i take it the year has gone very quickly for you absolutely yeah i mean i i actually listened this morning to the interview that i did with you nearly a year ago uh, and it was amazing to see some of the intentions that I had at that time and what has come to fruition in that year. It's been a very busy year, but an absolutely fantastic year as well. Any particular highs you would identify from the year then? I'm sure there's been lots of lots of different events going on, but anything which has sort of stuck in your mind from your year? Uh, yeah, for me, I think um, the development of this game that I've been working on has been one of the highs. So for me, it brings together so many different aspects of things that I was interested in before the residency. Um, and to find a way to put that together in, in one kind of thing and then share it with the public has been so fantastic. I think I've played it with over 500 people now on the island and hopefully that's going to continue beyond this as well. Do you think it's actually altered you as an artist or your art itself, have you sort of been inspired to think in different ways about your art, how you work in your art, the type of your art? Do you think it has actually changed your artwork? I think so. And and not only that, but it's given me the opportunity to really work on projects that I've wanted to do for years and years and years and just haven't had the opportunity. So to be given that platform to be able to, to bring my greatest passions together and be supported by Manx Wildlife Trust and UNESCO Biosphere Isle of Man has is, is just been such a gift and a joy. Much more on that from Ali and Graham next week. That's about it for this week. Don't forget, if you want to hear anything again, go to manxradio.com, download the Spotlight podcast and listen where and when you want. Why not try it while starting your Christmas shopping particularly early? See you next week when we'll hear more from Ali and Graham and also be hearing a bit about the latest exhibition at the Loom Gallery in Laxey. Look after yourselves and until then, whatever you're doing, be creative about it. Cheerio. Cheerio.